Uh, in Maine, a uh, giant skeleton was found. And with it, iron implements, copper bands covered with curious carvings. Uh, um, you find a lot of these reports of hieroglyphs, curious carvings from the Smithsonian to other researchers to town records. There seems there was another culture with a different language. Who you will see, six foot six, was rather large. Iron, iron implements. You, you know, that's the thing. The argument that the Native Americans, if they could uh, work with iron and create uh, alloys with metal, why did they lose that capability? It, and uh, it's a sophisticated thing. And this is in Gill, the town history. Possession of a copper tomahawk unearthed together with the skeleton of a gigantic Indian brought from the region of Lake Superior, history of Western Mass. Um, Lake Superior is where the mines are, where they excavated 1.5 billion pounds of copper. And all that copper was found not only in the earthworks of the mound builders, but also all around New England. In Springfield, uh, you know, the, the trade routes were everywhere. They found uh, shells in Springfield from the Gulf Coast of, uh, of um, Louisiana. And there was this interaction, this, this sphere of trade all around um, the country. A giant skeleton, eight feet high? That's ridiculous, you know? Double row of teeth? We'll get to that part. So what was in the mounds when the Smithsonian and others excavated? The eyes of that extinct species of giant whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as I, our eyes do now. Abraham Lincoln, he was parroting what everybody knew at the time, that there was a race that built these structures that was giant in stature. Uh, he went to Niagara Falls in 1848. And he was so um, enthralled with it, he wrote a 500-word meditation. And that's where that passage comes from. I'm sure nobody's ever seen that, and I wonder why. So, the New York Times has hundreds of um, newspaper headlines about what they found at the time. Nine foot, over nine foot high skeleton found. Nine foot in a Wisconsin mound. This one is 10 foot nine. Uh, this one is very interesting. Uh, Warren K. Moorhead. Um, Moorhead uh, was in a an archaeologist, one of the most famous ones at the time. And he unearthed maritime archaic burial sites in Maine. And they say his career was ruined because he theorized that one day they would find bones of the maritime archaic that were very old. Excuse me. And they would find them up in you know, Nelliac Cove in Labrador in, in the northern climates. He was proven right 70 years later. But I have a feeling his career was ruined more because of this and less because of that. Uh, he started to find giant skeletons, giant skeletons in copper armor, things like that in the mounds, all documented. Uh, and Moorhead was, he found an eight foot, um, I'll get to that story, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But anyways, this is what he found in, in Tioga Point, Pennsylvania. 68 skeletons averaging seven feet with many much larger. Specimens sent to the American Investigating Museum in Philly. Later, the museum claimed they were stolen and have never been seen again. Uh, that's a shame. Uh, so, you get these reports from Scientific American, American Antiquarian, the Smithsonian Records, New York Times, Town Histories. I have amassed now nearly a thousand accounts of giant skeletons in ancient America. There are other authors who um, write books about these things, and you, you will see that it is, uh, it is a lot more well known than one would think. So, the Native Americans talk, talked about um, massive cemeteries filled with um, Giant skeletons, they were dismissed as, as crazy um, you know, myths. Uh, Scientific American, a tradition of giants. That doesn't sound like an isolated ca case, a tradition. Uh, the Smithsonian, this is one of the lot, they have many accounts of seven and eight foot skeletons in their records in the ethnology reports from 1890 to 1894. One of the largest ones, seven and eight feet. Uh, my editor, uh, Wayne May, Ancient American, a lot of articles are, um, printed in this magazine about the, what we're talking about. This, this particular one was about three um, over eight foot skeletons found in a Kentucky, it was re, the article was reprinted from 1873 in a Kentucky cave. Uh, this is uh, the San Diego giant eight foot four. I know it looks fake, but this is real. 
three scientists from the Smithsonian showed up. Uh, these guys were displaying this like a sideshow act at a, a World's Fair, or, I mean some fair in San Diego. They found it eight foot four in a cave. Smithsonian agents, they examined it, they determined it, it was um, authentic. They did tests on it, they bought it for 500 bucks, and we haven't heard from it again. The Smithsonian has 18,000 skeletons of mound builders and Native Americans that nobody can look at. Yes, this it was called the largest skull in the world in Texas, found by WPA workers in the 30s, right there. They unearthed other large bones there. So, Carolyn Spark, head of the records at Texas Archaeological Research Lab, said, the particular specimen that you ask about, the large skull followed at the Mohouse site in 1939, is noted in our paperwork as missing from the collection and has been for some time. This is the norm. When you investigate these things, when you talk to people, where are the skeletons? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times, there are some around, but a lot of them go missing. 10 foot 9, this was found by the sheriff in Welling, Virginia. Another thing, um, uh, you know, reputable people found these things. Uh, chief justices, judges, uh, doctors. And doctors would always be brought in to, to look at these remains. They would measure them. The, the, the town's people would be astounded. It would be in the records, you know, as if, and they would say, like, as if never to forget on this day, you know, this 9 foot skeleton was found and there were people gathered around at the enormous creature from the Stone Age or whatever, however they would speculate about it. So it's not, um, the, the, you know, it, it is a well-known thing. Uh, the Lovelock um, skulls, back guano farmers in the 20s found a series of eight, nine foot mummified giants in Lovelock, Nevada. Uh, the skeletal remains went to, uh, part of them went to um, the Humboldt Museum. Barbara Powell, the curator there, uh, sent back an email saying, yes, in fact, we have some of the Lovelock skulls, the giant skulls. David Hatcher Childress, the researcher, showed these on the History Channel. Uh, that he, It's in a back drawer, but it was on a History Channel special, and he showed the specimens. This is interesting. Uh, this is a site off Santa Rosa Island. Ralph Glidden works for the Hay Foundation as an archaeologist. He spent 10 years here, and he unearthed 3,781 skeletons the largest was nine foot two. The average was over seven foot for 10 years. And here is the, uh, right there, and this is for courtesy of Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, over seven feet tall. And this is the double rows of teeth. Uh, when you read these reports, you find double rows of teeth, unusually thick jaw, um, unusually thick skull, jaw bones that can fit over the size of a large man. Just uh, very strange uh, skeletal remains that speak of a different race altogether. So this was found in Clearwater, Minnesota. The highly unusual teeth, skulls had double rows of teeth in both the upper and lower jaws. These reports are widely dispersed. This isn't just one guy who doesn't know what he's talking about. This is everywhere, hundreds of them. So after I went and I found the eight foot uh, double rows of teeth, um, report, I went to the uh, Pioneer Valley Museum to see if they knew anything about Sheldon and him finding these remains. So I went to the PV, MM, and I spoke with them. Uh, I sat down, I went through the records and, and the nice gentleman there said, you may be interested in this. It is the uh, scrapbook, the archeological scrapbook of George Sheldon. And this was my Da Vinci Code moment. I just knew what I was going to find. And I had this, it was amazing. I had this electric shock ran through my body. It, it was quite uh, a happening. So I opened it up, and what did I find? Sheldon, his entire scrapbook was filled with accounts of the mound builders, of theories about the race that they were, about a lot of conjecture, uh, about that they were a different race altogether. I'm sorry, let me interject here. The, Smithsonian erroneously concluded in the 1890s, uh, John Wesley Powell the, um, of Grand Canyon um, exploration fame, he was the director of the Smithsonian. And for whatever political reason, maybe for a land grab, I don't know what was happening at the time that would account for this. And there's a lot of like Old Testament stuff mixed in in the 1890s. There was undercurrents that, that formed opinions at the time. So Powell 
concluded uh, that Native Americans, uh, that mound builders were the ancestors of the Native Americans, and that was the end of the story. So that was the, that was put out, and that's what uh, the, uh, the rule that was to be followed. So everything else seemed to be buried and f funneled into that really narrow um, um, passageway. So what you find here is Sheldon kind of railing against that theory. And then what I found was giant skeleton reports in his book, The Gill Skeleton. They found a giant skeleton in Gill. A Mr. Sanderson gave the remains to the museum. I mean, to the, um, yeah, the museum. Seven and eight foot uh, skeletons in Ohio. There's reports of giant skeletons all throughout um, Sheldon's book, Northfield. The catalog of curiosities and relics, right here. Uh, they had the remains of an, it says, an over eight foot skeleton at the museum. They had the Indian room before it was considered, uh, you know, reprehensible to have Native American human remains, although I think they were mound builder remains, which might be a different thing. But anyways, they had giant skeletons from Northfield, Gill, and an over eight foot one from Ohio that they reinterred sometime in the century. So that existed. It's in the records. They had it on display for many years, uh, starting in 1883, which is very strange. So I started to, I read about 10,000 pages of uh, historical, um, I mean, uh, about town histories in Western Mass, and then I'm a technological neophyte, so I finally figured out I can use Google Books and do keywords, and it got me, uh, <laughs> I know, it's pathetic. Uh, so what I found was, this is from Sheldon's book, uh, seven foot skeleton, double rows of teeth, skull of remarkable thickness in Hadley. Um, this is in Turner's Falls, seven seven foot skeletons, history of Montague, 1910. Seven seven footers. Uh, this is in Rockingham, Vermont. The jawbone was of such size that a large man could easily slip it over his face and the teeth, which were all perfect, were double. This is interesting. I, this is, I'm looking into this and try to find the skeleton still remains. The bones of this giant were of remarkable preservation. The skull is very thick. Teeth in both jaws are entire, all of them double. William Prescott of the city has preserved the largest skeleton. Boston Medical and Surgical Journal. That is not UFO magazine. That is, you know. When the skeleton was measured, Doc, this is Middleborough where I grew up, Dr. Morrill and others found it to be at least seven foot eight with double rows of teeth in each jaw. Many more giant skeletons are found in Middleborough, actually. Uh, this is in Martha's Vineyard. Several giant ones were found. Seven feet high, an unusual feature was a complete double row of teeth, upper and lower jaws. This is what you find. You find the same curiosity, the same phrasings about these, you know, we found the hell is this? You know, uh, sorry, but you know, double rows of teeth. It just doesn't make any sense. And it, it is uh, borne out in all these accounts. Uh, this was um, W.K. Moorhead, William uh, Warren Moorhead. He found eight foot skeletons um, in Connecticut, the archaeologist I was talking about whose career was ruined. Uh, he also found, this was in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, earthen mounds there. In the Smithsonian 1891 report, it's listed in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut as having extensive um, earthworks in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So the mound builders had extensive earthworks in Bridgeport, and then you find eight-foot skeletons there also. Uh, sorry to throw so much at you. Uh, you know, the questions are, where are they, what's going on? This gives you a kind of a, a feel for what's going on here. Uh, about the Smithsonian and their involvement in this. A large Indian mound was um, opened near Gasterville, Pennsylvania by a committee of scientists from the Smithsonian. At some depth of the sur uh, from the surface, a kind of vault was found in which was discovered the skeleton of a giant measuring seven foot two inches, ornamented with a copper crown. On the stones which covered the vault were carved inscriptions, hieroglyphs, and when deciphered, will doubtless lift the veil that now shrouds the history of the race of people that once inhabited the par this part of the continent. The relics have been carefully packed and forwarded to the Smithsonian Institution, and they are said to be the most interesting collection ever found in the U.S. The explorers are now at work on another mound in Barton uh, County, Pennsylvania. 
Seven foot three, strange hieroglyphs that, glyphs that need, need to be deciphered. Copper crown, 130 years past, and we've never heard this. This, isn't, this is American antiquarian who wrote this report. These are scientists who took part in these digs. The, these just disappeared. Uh, one thing I found interesting when I was <laughs> reading um, the reports, I found that a lot of them were for the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons of giant skeletons. And so I started to read the kind of secret texts of the Freemasons. I hope I make it to next week. Um, <laughs> and I would find the same kind of reports, giant skeletons, uh, double rows of teeth. Uh, and part, uh, embedded in the history, they believe, or they, they passed down, I think the Freemasons from the priests, temple priests of Heliopolis in Egypt. I think there was a lineage of, of knowledge that has been passed down about the hidden history of the human race. And part of that is interwoven in this whole story, a lost civilization uh, that's uh, more than 12,000 years old that came to the United States and other places after a great flood. It's very interesting that you would find this same stuff in the texts of the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons. Very, very interesting. Um, um, so what you find all around the planet are thousands of structures like this. Uh, Puma Punku, the pyramids, Nan Medal, you know, 500 million tons of uh, quarried basalt brought from several miles across mountains on the, in, in Micronesia, one of the most remote, remotest places on Earth. Uh, Puma Punku, Bolivia, 17,000 year old city of Tiwanaku in Puma Punku, where you have um, um, stone crosses uh, dug into diorite, the hardest, second hardest substance on Earth. You would need CNC machines to do all the cutting, just things that boggle the mind. And we're told that we came from uh, a semi civilized state and now at the apex of civilization. Something is clearly wrong. That site proves it. There is much more evidence of older uh, structures all around the planet. You don't find just one. That's all you find. Just like the giant skeleton reports, you don't just find one. Something's profoundly wrong in what we're being told. And I think it's obvious by all the interest here and all the people here. You know you've been lied to, you're irritated, and you're sick of it. You know? It could be the Fed, it could be the military industrial complex, whatever it is. It's beyond parties. It's about humanity and wanting to create a civilization of love and connection versus fear and separation, quite honestly. And that's why all these systems that don't work appear to be crumbling before our eyes, you which is a good thing.